date of posting this is New Year's Eve 2023. I'm far from the only channel that does these sorts of in-review videos, but I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of pull the curtain back, not only on my creative process, but give a little insight into the guy behind Tengu, all while looking at where we've been and where I'd like to go from here into the new year. To that end, I'm going to start this video the same way I plan to end it, with a question. What would you like to see from the channel in 2024? This can be anything from improvements to content ideas. Feel free to go comment now if you want to, but like I said, I'm going to ask the same question at the end of the video. Your ideas might be affected by the end, I'm not sure. Also, this video is going to be topically everywhere. If you're making New Year's appetizers or something, you aren't missing out visually at all, I promise. There's just no way I could match footage to some of these topics. Alright, without further ado. I'd say it has been a pretty good year for the channel overall. My goal for 2023 was really just to establish a kind of proof of viability for my style of content. A lot of martial arts channels revolve around tutorials and sparring footage and stuff like that. I'd like to do that stuff at some point, but I'll talk about some of the barriers to that in a second. My concern seems to have been unfounded, though, because we went from like 0 to 2,500 and some change subscribers in 6 months or so. By measures of YouTube success, that is still a very, very humble size, but I'm also very thankful for the growth. And by the way, I'm also thankful for the type of growth, too. A lot of comments on my videos have been very thoughtful over the past few months, which is nice, especially in this niche. My experience has been that martial arts discourse online has a tendency to derail pretty quickly and is often perpetuated by people that probably don't even train that much just based on what they're actually saying. While some of that is well within my expectations as the channel progresses, I'm happy to report that, so far, it's pretty clear that a majority of folks are not only martial artists themselves, but are indeed critically thinking about my content while having the wisdom to not just tow tribalistic lines. It's honestly super refreshing, and I couldn't really ask for much better. In my book, this growth and the kind of audience that we've got here is a massive win. Thank you so much. Just like any other young channel, I've really had to find my footing with the editing process. I'm not at all brand new to editing, but I'm also far from professional. Similarly, I'm very used to writing, just not in the YouTube setting. So while some stuff has felt quite natural, other things have had to get adjusted to. And you're probably going to keep seeing these little modifications throughout 2024 and beyond. Just like martial arts, I view content creation as a process that never really ends. One thing that I really wanted to hammer out early on, though, was my audio. I don't have the most complex audio process or the most expensive equipment, but I'm happy to report that absolutely no one has brought up my audio as far as I've seen, which is a middle ground that I am very satisfied with. I've listened to a lot of small channels over the years whose content was genuinely innovative and interesting, but their audio was just atrocious. Audio is such a funny thing, too, because a sign of quality is usually that no one notices it. Like I said, I don't have the meatiest, juiciest podcast audio, nor do I really have the voice for that, but for the time investment I'm making, I've been pleased that no one seems to take notice of my audio. My footage, though, oh boy, my footage is a whole other story. 
So it should come as no surprise to my regular viewers that I use a lot of old-timey, often amateur martial arts demonstration footage. On one hand, very few people have actually pointed this out, and I know several decent-sized channels that do sort of the same thing to pretty great effect. I'm also outing the history nerd in myself here, but I'm kind of taken with the aesthetics of old film, even if it adds nothing informationally to the experience. Having said all that, I do eventually want to have some videos of myself doing more tutorial slash concept slash sparring slash workout slash vlog slash whatever else type videos. I even have a pretty decent camera that I bought exactly for this. The problem has been that martial arts are, more often than not, a two-person affair. This has been a tricky problem. I do train in two separate dojos in the area, but the martial arts I do are kind of in this weird spot locally. To put things bluntly, most students are either very young or pretty old, and very few having been training as long as I have. Now, from a purely martial arts perspective, there is nothing wrong with that, like at all. From a YouTube creation perspective, though, I can't help but feel that it is a little bit insincere on my part if I were going to use these people as partners. I'm a smaller guy, but I'm just under 30 years old and have been doing martial arts since I was five. So I'm kind of in that magical stretch of 10 years or so where I have a lot of technical knowledge and I'm fairly fit. I feel like videos where I'm using teenagers or seniors as partners in sparring or whatever else is going to undermine the message that I'm trying to send a bit and probably make me look better than I really am. The reality is that despite my significant time investment in martial arts, I am still a smaller dude and people more in my age slash fitness range can and often will still give me problems. I'm not trying to portray myself as invincible or some kind of martial arts genius. I'm just not. I don't want to unintentionally build a weird kind of mythos around my own skill. I'm very much still just a dude. Plus, underpinning all that is that these training facilities aren't mine. Some places and people just don't want to be online. And it isn't because they're hiding anything or anything like that. They just want their privacy, which ought to be respected. You might be wondering where all the young studs are at. Like, why is there a demographic hole in training partners to begin with? The answer, I think, is really down to popularity. In the 2000s and early 2010s, there were a lot of us, us being younger people. I was very much a part of that cadre as well, but in hindsight, I think we were riding out the last days of the karate boom that started as early as the 60s or 70s. Speaking frankly, a lot of traditional martial arts just aren't quote-unquote cool anymore. Some of this is their own fault. I think the competitive rule sets in Japanese martial arts in particular have been lackluster and getting weaker, for example, in recent years. Not to mention that a lot of traditional martial arts aren't very good at marketing themselves in the age of social media. But some of this, too, is that other arts are in the middle of their own heyday. I'm thinking of BJJ specifically. And to be very clear, I do not begrudge BJJ for its success. Cultural trends come and go. I'm sure BJJ's popularity will one day wane a bit, too. It's just the natural cycle of things. But if I had to say where all the 20-somethings are at, it's at one of the 15 BJJ gyms that litter my teeny area here. There are tons of reasons for this, but I'm not going to get into the weeds on that in a channel in review video. So I'm also very probably moving to Japan in 2024. 
It's hard to say right now, but we are looking at somewhere probably in spring or early summer. I don't know for sure if you've ever had to deal with the Japanese government for anything at all. You know that they move very much at their own pace. But hopefully, if all goes as planned, maybe like April or May. You might be thinking then that I could solve this problem of not having a place to film or a partner there. And the answer is maybe, because it's still going to be difficult. <laughs> Japanese privacy law is pretty ironclad, and actually a lot of dojos are very explicit about not allowing film. It's usually on their websites. It's usually on the little piece of paper that you sign when you start training at a place. Plus, culturally, the Japanese are a very private people. It seems like a lot of American tourists and definitely content creators have forgotten their manners when they travel abroad, and I'm not about to add my name to a long-growing list of embarrassments. Now, could I theoretically recruit some friends and go train in a public space? Sure, but I can't tell you at this exact moment how that will play out. In short, I would love to do on-the-mat, in-person type videos, but until I can iron out the details, please just bear with the old-timey footage for now. The last minor shift in my content I want to point out is how I've used quotes and sources. In my two earliest videos, I was really heavy on my sourcing. All my videos since then definitely use sources, but I've stepped back from making sure they are front and center. I'm a big consumer of history content on YouTube, and in my experience, some of the very best history work on the entire platform is done by super small channels. The reason that they are small, though, is that their stuff is so dense and dry that it alienates the average viewer. I don't think many people actually go and read the sources when they are being shown on screen or in a description. It does add some level of authority, but I would say maybe one in a thousand viewers actually goes and does the additional reading, which just is what it is. I'm not trying to yell at anybody about anything. That's just how things are. People are much more interested in narrative than they are in straightforward fact and a lot of nuance, things that are implicit to the historical field. I've been through a graduate history program before, so I'm well aware that dryness and quality of information seem to just correlate. I think a sign of maturity in a historian, though, is recognizing that communication is part of the job. You can't sacrifice good research for that or veer into unfounded dramatization, but you also can't be boring. In short, this section is really just in here to say that if you want more reading material from me, you can always ask, and I'll probably be more than happy to dump a list of books on you. I've just moved away from packing all of that into videos directly. I have so many projects planned for this channel that it's actually a bit overwhelming. First and foremost, I want to knock out my martial arts philosophy videos. As of posting this video, we've done the Who Talks About Martial Arts video and the Martial Arts Aren't a Science video. I think we probably have about three more of these to go or so, roughly speaking. The next video dealing with market forces in martial arts is recorded. I just need to slap some footage onto it. Beyond that, there should be a video on metagames in martial arts, and then one that deals with sincerity in the martial arts. The goal of that series is really just to illustrate my approach to analysis in martial arts. Functionally, this is so if anyone ever gets confused about my position, I can just link them to that playlist. Creatively, though, I think it's a good baseline for the channel. Everything thereafter will be building on those ideas or otherwise referencing them. Another thing I have planned is a video, or maybe a series of videos, I'm not sure yet, on how politics interfaces with martial arts. I know, 
hold in your excitement. That doesn't sound very exciting, but I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, and I don't just mean politics internally either, but also externally. In fact, to much greater interest externally. It seems to me that a lot of people believe that martial arts live or die purely by their usefulness in X, Y, or Z competitive format, and this really isn't true. So, I'd like to look at historical events like the Boxer Rebellion, the Cultural Revolution, the War, and subsequent American occupation of Japan, and other like instances to see how these events repressed, eroded, or even destroyed martial traditions. I'm not sure if I can squeeze all of that into a single video or not, so maybe it's like a three-parter. We'll see. Another thing that I was working on was like a five-part Aikido video. I have two Aikido videos out right now, and those are sort of sliced out of a much larger script and then rearranged to be way more succinct. My original script is massive, like well over 100,000 words massive. It was going to be a much more narrative-driven format that was going to cover a lot of concepts I've been dancing around on the channel anyway. Stuff like not worshipping teachers and founders and stuff I've yet to get to, like the aforementioned destructive power that war and occupation had. I've shelved this for now for several reasons. The first reason is that I'd like to ease people into some of these ideas. The script was bloated mostly because I had to explain a lot of these concepts piecemeal and then use a specific Aikido example. If I do do this series in the future, I'd prefer to just be able to link folks back to older content. The second reason is that I think there is a dimension to that story that deserves to be told, which can only be done once I get my Japanese up to speed a bit more. I'm in the process of studying again, and I was probably pretty close to being able to do this anyway about three years ago, but COVID has rusted my abilities immensely. For whatever reason, this time around, it's not just like riding a bike. It's like something entirely different has occupied that part of my brain. So I am studying again, so hopefully soon. But in terms of the video, there's this whole mess of political intrigue in Aikido in the lead up to and during World War II. And I'd prefer to read more primary documents on that before putting it into a video. So I'm going to have to work on my Japanese language. I'm working on it anyway, so I can, you know, work in the country more effectively. That might be coming somewhere down the line, maybe late 2024. A third and much more long-term project is a series looking at the formalization of the first martial arts schools. Now, to be fair... This is sort of something that I just have an inkling of. It's barely a hypothesis and really just an itch on my prefrontal cortex. There is this event, or really a period of time, in the 14th through 16th centuries where piracy was rampant in East Asia. This is a period that really only seems like it's recently come to the attention of people outside of academia. While martial arts certainly existed before this period, it's right smack in the middle of this period that we suddenly get the first martial arts manuscripts, manuals, and true blue martial arts schools. Although the piracy tends to be attributed to the Japanese specifically, these bands were usually multi-ethnic, featuring Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese among others lending credence to the idea that these raids somehow are linked to the formalization of martial arts schools is the fact that schools and manuals all pop up in every country I just listed pretty much right at the same time. Likewise, Fujian province in China is considered an epicenter of Chinese martial tradition, while Kyushu in Japan's southernmost main island is similarly a haven of old martial culture. Not to mention that smack in between is the Ryukyu Kingdom, known today as Okinawa and the birthplace of karate, which is well known to have mainland roots. Now, could all of this be a heaping helping of circumstantial evidence? Yes, it absolutely could be. 
but I think it is a question worth asking. The reason this is going to have to be a super long-term project is that my old Japanese and my Mandarin and my Cantonese are all pretty much trash. My old Japanese is a little bit better, obviously, but uh, those other two need a lot of work. I'd have to get a lot better at these languages or tap someone I trust who knows them, some charitable colleagues perhaps, to help me out with this project. You probably wouldn't see this finished or maybe even started in 2024, but it is on my mind. Those are kind of my big ticket ideas for the future, but I do have a bunch of other little ones swimming around the old noggin too. To list a few, I want to translate a couple technical excerpts from famous judoka Kyuzo Mifune's writings, most of which are woefully unavailable in English, and do some commentary on them. I'm a big fan of Mifune, and I rank him highly as one of those historical martial artists that have had a big influence on me over the years. I have a vague idea to do a road trip slash vlog series once I get to Japan, where I visit the major locations of famous samurai Miyamoto Musashi's life. That idea is kind of season dependent, so I'm not sure I could hack it in 2024 though. Similarly, I would like to do a hike of the Nakasendo Trail in Japan, which is the historical post road from the Edo period. I like to hike a lot, but again, I'll be focused on getting settled in this year, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to squeeze that into my schedule. Finally, I've also got a mind to do a video on how martial artists trained historically versus now in both the East and the West. I think that sort of thing could be useful when it comes to elucidating why some martial arts might not be seeing the same success as others, as well as just identifying shortcomings in our own training. Finally, I do want to give a little blurb about my own martial arts practice because it's sort of related to the channel, at least tangentially. Like I said in my first Aikido video, from 2017 to 2020, I was training like almost full time, like it was a job. Something like three to five hour sessions, six days a week, plus the off mat stuff like running, hiking, video study, yada yada yada. Once the pandemic hit, things obviously slowed way down. For the last two years or so, my training across all three of my main disciplines, karate, judo, and aikido, have really been just about keeping up fitness and working on some technical things. This is mostly down to the fact that I work a pretty physical job at weird hours, and my training partners are, like I mentioned earlier, quite young or a bit older, which again is totally fine. I just can't also be burying them every session. That isn't fair or useful to anyone. In 2024, my aim is to, first and foremost, inject my training with a bit more specificity. Off the mat, this means trying to build a program around movements that transfer to my martial arts better. I've never been a huge fan of weights. I very much acknowledge what they can do. I've just never been a fan of them for myself, personally. I've always preferred calisthenics. But I do need to find a healthy middle ground between exercises that I enjoy and exercises that I can better and more easily progressively overload. I've got some ideas on that, and maybe that is a video unto itself for later. I'm not sure. It just kind of depends on how interesting I think it is. As for my focus when I make landfall in Japan, I know that this is probably going to trigger some folks, but I've got a mind to refocus on Aikido. My reasoning here is several fold. The first is that I'm fairly confident in my striking these days. There's always room to get better, yes, absolutely, but the last three years has reminded me just how quote-unquote in my bones striking is. I've been punching and kicking and sparring almost since I could walk. While I'd never say it comes natural to me, striking at this point is almost second nature. I don't really have to think about it, and easing back into it really doesn't take much time at all. I think if I were to do a striking art in Japan, 
it would have to be something that isn't karate. I love karate, but at this point, I'd want it to be something that gives me a different perspective. In the case of judo, which I also adore, I feel as if my ship has sailed a bit with it. This doesn't mean I'll stop training it when I have the opportunity or stop producing content that talks about it. Not at all. Some of my favorite techniques are from judo, and judo is still a major part of my training after all. Having said that, Japan very much has a kind of judo pipeline that I miss the train on more than a bit. Also, in terms of YouTube niches, I think judo is very well represented in English already. It's not as popular as BJJ these days, but what is? Regardless, there are a lot of judo creators that do a very good job. And again, that doesn't mean that there's no room for judo content on my channel. I will absolutely be producing some videos in that vein, just that I think there are a half dozen channels or so that do really God's work for that martial art already. They don't need another channel to cover the same ground. With Aikido, though, I feel as if there is a lot more potential there for me as a martial artist and as a creator. This is especially so because I think a lot of Western Aikido practice is, well, frankly, kind of trash. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Whereas my training over there, at least this last time, was pretty heavy, and I think I could find places that are even more martial than that if I really looked. The only reason I was training the way I was with the people I was was because it was on college campus. Uh, not to say that I disliked it, it was a formative experience, but if I went out and looked harder, I'm sure I could find other things. On the creator side of it, popular discussion on Aikido in English is painfully one note, in my opinion. It kind of is just that trash martial art. And I know of at least a few channels that have risen to popularity mostly on affirming that or trying to fix it or whatever else. I think there is a lot of meaningful and deserving criticism of Aikido on English YouTube. But I also find that even some of the most prominent voices have a fairly limited view of the topic. Just as an example, I've seen more than one YouTuber essentially say that the antidote to Aikido is just like, do BJJ, bro? This always gives me a chuckle because it feels quintessentially American to me. Like, BJJ is a massive martial art over here these days. A lot of these creators were already doing BJJ anyhow, too. It feels like that old premise where if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I sense that there is a lot of room for education in the Aikido sphere. I think there is a lot of stuff that people misunderstand, and sometimes that is Aikido's own fault. I totally grant that. The flip side, though, is that I don't see, I don't know, what I'd expect to see from people when they say they are trying to get the art to function for them. I'd expect to see more folks go look into various styles of Aikido. I'd expect to see people reading the opinions of prominent teachers who have had a lot of similar criticisms. I'd expect to see a lot more cross-training in many different styles to really try and pin down ways to adapt Aikido. I don't feel like people are leaving every rock unturned, for example. I think instead people are looking for good narratives for their videos, which I can't really blame them for, but at the same time that's just not how I would do things. Instead, I usually see one of two things. The apologists who say that nothing is wrong and that, in fact, Aikido is secretly nigh perfect as is, which I don't agree with, of course. Or I see folks who will be like, look, I got an Aikido thing to work this one time in a BJJ role or something. While I know he is a divisive figure in Aikido circles, I do have respect for Rockus trying to get his stuff to work in sparring sessions, for example. But in my humble opinion, I think his approach has been kind of all over the place. Without going too far into it, I'm not convinced he's really going about it in the best way. Now, 
I don't really begrudge people for this necessarily. A lot of these guys make a living by being content creators. Maybe they've just deemed a more methodical approach to being not very conducive to making good videos. Likewise, I'm not at all blaming people for not dropping everything, learning a totally new language, and then moving to Japan, all for some kind of insight into Aikido that they may or may not find. But hey, I'm definitely going to do just that. I'll throw on a white belt and go learn from different teachers under different styles. I will read as much as I possibly can and be looking to adapt things to my own view of my own martial art that I've internalized. It's all cross-training for me. I'll have a good time. And if people think that's a waste, or if it even objectively is a waste, then whatever. It's my channel and all that. Alright, that is really it for me. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I'd love to know what you would like to see from this channel going forward, though. If you have tips on quality or just general content ideas, please let me know by all means. Otherwise, this was a pretty good year for the channel, and that is down to you guys. Thank you so much, and I will see you in 2024. I wish you and yours the best and a happy new year. Os.